Bob Justice, and I'm here today with Emily Wheeler of Columbia, South Carolina, and we're visiting on the front porch of the Waverly Inn in Hendersonville. This site and uh, the surrounding close area is very important in Hendersonville's tourist history, and uh, this very site has been an active tourist destination for over 100 years. This very uh, uh, spot that we're on, the Waverly Inn, has seen a lot of those visitors over the past hundred years, and it remains pretty much the same as it did a hundred years ago. But the area around it has changed significantly. And uh, we're fortunate to have Emily with us today. She has a huge amount of information on what has happened uh, within the eye shot of us. And across the street from uh, the Waverly, just across 8th Avenue, is the site today of Boyd Park. And at the turn of the 20th century, it was the site of the Noterman home. Uh, and uh, a point that we'll talk about later, it was uh, uh, one, the original Hendersonville High School. But the Noterman home uh, was important to Emily because that was her great-grandfather and across the street was her great-grandfather uh, Wheeler at the Wheeler Hotel. And uh, she just has a wonderful uh, amount of information and history and photos on uh, uh, both of these sites. And I wonder, Emily, how in the world did you come into all of this information and know it so well? Well, most all of this information belonged to my grandmother, Emily Noteman Wheeler, for whom I'm named. And when I was a little girl, I used to spend a lot of time with her down at her home in Batesburg. And she had all these family pictures that were always all over the house, all over her bedroom. And many of those photos ended up being collected into a great big trunk that was down under our home, stored in Ridge Spring. The children would go through these trunks and play and scatter things all in the sand down there. And my mother really worried about this. And she was like a little acolyte to my grandmother. So mother <laughs> gathered these things up and put them in all of these boxes and tried to keep them and keep the children and all of us out of them the best that she could. But most important to my mother was of all these three little baby books that Emily Wheeler had done on each of her children. Mm. And as you can imagine, her first sure. child, David Henry Wheeler, had a very large book. Mm. Her second child, my Aunt Clara, had a middle-sized book. And this is my father's book, the very smallest one of all. <laughs> and that is the way that my mother left it all tied up in string and ribbon because she said she was never going to let us open these things again, that they were falling apart. <laughs> and I decided to take them out and scan them as years went by and technology changed. And we wouldn't really have to open them up anymore. We could all look at the pages That's and see wonderful. what was in them. Also, we have her journal, and this tells us so much about Hendersonville, the area, the hotel, um, goings on here. The, the journal, in addition, has lots of information. There's this picture of the family sitting around the table in Hendersonville. I took this off my wall this morning. My wall's a bear. I brought a lot up here. This is Emily as a young girl across the street, and this was taken by her brother-in-law, John Ostoff who was a wonderful photographer and who we credit with many of these pictures. We're not sure, but I would say he took this even though he's in it, I would think so. But he signed this one down here. And this is a picture of her father, Joseph Noteman. I'm only I'm talking a lot about this because we have so much information on the Notemans, but we don't have so much information or pictures of the Wheelers for one simple reason. Oh, yeah. And I know that, again, the information that you find out is because here in one of these baby books, she tells us that the house burned in 1906. We would not know that, but I figure that this is what happened to a lot of the Wheeler family pictures that we don't have so many because they burned up in that fire in the house. I'm sure that's what happened. Mm -hmm. So the reason that I came up here to see you last summer, I happened to see you all then, was that I discovered in these treasures this photo that was behind the door. This is kind of thing, there's so much of this material. This, when my husband
husband and I were up here a year ago. Our electricity was out in Columbia, and we decided we were going to have to stay in a motel for two days, so if you've got to do that, why not let's just go up to Hendersonville. And we drove up on the hill there to the Drysdale School, and we're looking out over the scenery down here and most of all over that hill and toward the house, and I saw this lovely bed and breakfast down here. So last year, my father's 100th birthday was coming up, and I thought, why don't we just go up and spend the night in Hendersonville? I just would like to feel it and how it was when he was born 100 years ago. I miss my father so much. Mm -hmm. And I looked up the, the B&B, and it turned out to be the Waverly Inn. And after I talked to Diane on the phone, she told me that this was built by the two daughters of Colonel Anderson who had lived in that home and I thought about this picture. My brother looked at me when he saw this and he said, where in the world did you find that? It was behind the door stuck somewhere it, where it had been hidden just in, in a corner with many of these things. And so here you really see the Waverly where we're sitting right now. Mm -hmm. And over here is the Joseph Nodeman home as it sat right there on that corner. So you really... And, and you might point out that 8th Avenue is not there uh, in those Bob, years. I don't know 8th Avenue. No, I get lost every time I come into town, including today. <laughs> but you go, tell me about 8th Avenue. 8th Avenue is the street right there between us and the side of the of, of the uh, Noterman home. 8th mm -hmm. Avenue is, is going right through this picture. And I Main know. Street would be right in front of it. I drove in last week coming from that side, and as we were coming across Boyd Park, I said to Denver, I said, do you realize we're driving right through Joseph Nodeman's dining room That's right. right now? That's right. But I do know that this house sat on over six acres of land because that's in the deed. Mm -hmm. So you can figure how large that was. It includes right. what is Hendersonville High School now. The house was there, yeah. but we'll talk about that right. as we go on. But. We have Very more information picture. here than we can probably process. We have now moved inside the Waverly Inn. We're in the front parlor, and uh, it's a little warmer in here than it was out there. A little cool this morning, that wonderful western North Carolina air. Uh, to continue our story, uh, the railroad came to Hendersonville in, eight, in July the 4th, 1879. And uh, the Wheeler Hotel was uh, opened for uh, business also July the 4th, 1899. So 20 years after the railroad came to Hendersonville, uh, the hotel opened. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, Wheeler family and uh, what, what brought the Wheelers here to build a hotel? And, uh, we David Henry Wheeler was a farm, they had a large farm in Newberry County, and he also had interest in the cotton mill and in the hotel there in Newberry, the Newberry Hotel. And if one looks at that hotel, which is still standing today, you will see that the architecture and the turrets on that hotel look an awful lot like the Wheeler mm -hmm. here, although I think that it was probably a local architect because there's more about the design of this hotel that matches buildings here. They hauled, when Someone obviously saw the need for a hotel here and talked to him and convinced him that they ought to come up here and build a hotel here in Hendersonville similar to the one that they were running there in Newberry. And so they took lumber from their farm and hauled it up here and that's how it got here. Mm -hmm. I have read uh, in, in some of the, I think it was Frank Fitzsimmons book, that uh, it was a group of local Hendersonville businessmen who uh, uh, wanted a hotel brought here. Someone and, who talked him into and it. And apparently they yeah. talked to your great-grandfather yeah. or that would be your great-grandfather. Great grandfather. And Bob, you know that when they built the railroad here, as you were just saying, it didn't all just open up at one time, which accounts for the gap there. Um, it was a while before they got Cincinnati hooked in and also Spartanburg, Greenville. And Major Anderson, who built the Nodeman, the Anderson house, it was purchased by Joseph Nodeman, which became the high school here. When Major Anderson came here, he was the superintendent of the railroad in Spartanburg and Greenville. So when those two cities were brought online and added to the Hendersonville Railroad, he moved up here and built the home where he lived here with his two nieces, lived there with him, and when he died, then the two nieces inherited the house and they're here. So. Um, the railroad brought the need for the tourism and the tourism mm -hmm. created the need for the hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, the superintendent of the, uh, when he passed away, the, the uh, uh, James Anderson, 
and his nieces uh, inherited, they moved to the Waverly where we are now. They built the Waverly with built the money the from the sale of the and, house. They built. And, they took the money and built this. Uh, Joseph Nodeman probably did not know the changes that were in store. There were lots of society activities and excitement at the hotel. Nightly dance bands in the gazebo and lovely girls dressed in beaded dresses, ostrich feathers, and Gibson girl hairdos. But hiking, swimming, boating, and trips out to Triple Falls in the same day, uh, it was the same as it is today. Uh, it was a great thing to do. Again, Hendersonville has perfect weather, cool days, and even cooler nights. There was no air conditioning a hundred years ago. Summers in the south were smothering. Families from Georgia, South Carolina, and surrounding states flocked to Hendersonville to escape. As soon as the railroad opened up across the area, there was, st there was still no paved roads in this mountainous area of North Carolina. And with the advent of the train, a trip up or down to the mountain to Hendersonville became easy. Who immediately recognized this perfect climate and its health benefits? It was a wealthy Cincinnati diamond merchant and jeweler, Joseph Noterman. He had always loved taking his family on numerous outdoor retreats in the hills of Kentucky. And as soon as the train opened up the Hendersonville area, he began coming down to the Henderson County area to bring his family. We have numerous photos of Joseph Noterman and his family enjoying hay rides, picnics, fishing, and hunting at Ball Mountain, Bear Wallow, and even his daughters and great-granddaughters waiting on the rocks at Triple Falls. It didn't take Joseph Noterman long to decide that the most perfect location for his retirement was one place, Hendersonville, North Carolina. A similar conclusion was also reached by George Washington Vanderbilt, who called the North Carolina Hills the most beautiful location he had ever seen. And accordingly, he built his home in Asheville at about the same time. Either of these men, and they both had traveled Europe extensively, could have had their pick of any place in the world to retire, but they both chose the identical area, Western North Carolina. In 1897, following the death of Major James Anderson, who had overseen the construction of the railroad through Henderson County, Joseph Noterman bought this adjacent street corner and the massive white Victorian house perched amid a huge fence six acre lot. The yard had been professionally landscaped from the outset, very unusual for its time, and the entire area was heavily wooded. This street was, of course, a dirt road and, mud and muddied a lot of the time. Joseph Noterman, his wife, and two youngest daughters, Jock and Emily, left Cincinnati and moved permanently to Hendersonville. Well, Bob, I want to say that when they moved here to Hendersonville, it would be like any two typical teenagers who were very unhappy to be yanked out of their home as they would be today. This is a picture of how Joseph and his daughters looked at about that age, and this would be, I think, the day of the last family outing that the family had together in Hendersonville. We have a picture of the whole family. But Joseph Noteman liked to go out into the woods and be in the countryside. Every outing that they ever did was a trip like this. But these little girls were being taken from their society life in the big city of Cincinnati where their father was the biggest jeweler in the place. And you can imagine to be moving to a strange area, Quite a leaving change. all their siblings. They were so unhappy. And in the material that we have, we have little Emily's autograph book. And it's just really so sad to see that she's been running around the house getting all of her brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles to sign her little autograph book. And here she says... Um, March the 31st, 1897, our dear Kentucky home, the last Monday, move at 6.30 a.m. It's <laughs> things like this that is when you know the day that they moved in these little documents that yeah, make up history. That's wonderful. And so the two girls did very well here. Once they got here to Hendersonville, it did not seem to take them long to get assimilated. And before long, he had them both enrolled at Queens College. And they both went there. Jock majored in voice and Emily majored in piano. So they were very happy with their mm -hmm. life here in Hendersonville. Quite a change, though. Yeah. But a year after Joseph Noterman moved here, the scene began to change. The trees on top of the hill across the street were cut down, and a massive 125-room hotel began to be built. 
by lumber hauled up the railroad from the Wheeler farm and the sawmill in Little Mountain, South Carolina. Furthermore, the two nieces of Colonel Anderson had taken the money from the sale of the Anderson house and built this very structure where we're sitting as a boarding house. That would provide a steady income for the two ladies. Others in this area had the same idea as can be seen from the boarding house next door and others in the same area. So on July the 4th, 1899, this fabulous brand new resort hotel opened right there on the high hill behind us here, quite literally launching tourism in Hendersonville. That must have been a glittering occasion. What can you tell us about that, Emily? Well, the Magic Online Richland County Library in Columbia, South Carolina <laughs> helped us come up with this this year. Here we have an ad for the opening of the Wheeler Hotel telling us that it's going to have its grand opening on July the 4th, 1899, and that lets us know the reason that I could not find this article in 1895, which Mr. <laughs> Fitzgibbon book had mentioned, but I now know this is when the hotel opened. And not to be outdone, we have a wonderful review of the grand opening of the hotel written by none other than the editor of the South Carolina State newspaper, William Elliott, Elliott oh, Gonzalez, who went on to become a well-known U.S. ambassador to Cuba, among other things, mm -hmm. and is just a very prominent person. The fact that the paper sent Mr. Gonzalez up, uh, that Mr. Gonzalez came in person for this, should tell you the importance of the event. I'm sure it was, it was quite a, the social event quite of the an season. Occasion. Quite and an I occasion. could read to you just a couple of lines from that. He talks about the lobby and the ballroom upstairs, and uh, there was even a bowling alley built in a separate building in the back. Can you imagine the ladies there in their long skirts and the duck pins? <laughs> there was a grand ballroom upstairs on the second floor and even a viewing area so that the chaperones could keep their eyes on the young ladies on the dance floor. The article also notes that there were plenty of young bachelors in attendance as well. <laughs> David Henry Wheeler's four eligible sons would have definitely been prominent in that group. His oldest son, Samuel Fair Wheeler, was a proprietor of the hotel. His second son, Jacob Simeon Wheeler, was a student at Tulane Medical School. The third son, Henry Franklin Wheeler, ran the livery stables that were located on the grounds of the hotel and would also operate a similar business in Columbia, South Carolina. The youngest son, Martin Luther Wheeler, was a student at Newberry College and would ultimately remain in Newberry uh, to own and manage the farm interest. We don't know if uh, the two young daughters of Joseph Noterman across the way were a part of these opening festivities, but we do know that there, were soon, there soon became a strong and permanent connection between these families. Emily, would you like to tell us more about that? It's very personal to you. Yes. <laughs> well, the two daughters were across the street. The hotel had opened, as we said, times were changing. And very soon after that, the youngest daughter, Aunt Jock, married right there in the Nodeman home. And so that left Joe, Minnie, and the youngest, the now next to the youngest daughter, Emily, there alone in the house. And so that summer they did what they had done before, which is they got aboard the SS Friesland and went back to Europe, which they had done several times before uh, on his diamond buying trips and his business trips. And so they went back and went to Milan and France and Switzerland and did the grand tour that summer. And I say this because we know it from cards and letters that they wrote back, souvenirs, that they brought, and so they returned home. Emily was homesick, they were glad to get back. But in these boxes of all the, fam the information, I was surprised the other day to find this little jewel, which is some cards and what becomes essentially love letters from even the captain of the ship to the young, beautiful <laughs> Miss Emily. And I think Joseph Nodeman must certainly have sat up and taken chair, taken note of this. And so, as could be predicted, he and his business friend, Mr. Wheeler, David Henry across the street, got to be matchmakers, I think, and they started to introduce their two young children, and so it was no surprise to anyone that the daughter of Joseph Nodeman, Emily Nodeman Wheeler, ended up marrying 
the proprietor of the hotel, the son of David Henry Wheeler, my grandfather, Samuel Fair Wheeler the yeah. first. And so from there, the Nodeman and the Wheeler families to us become a joint effort. So this corner of the street has one of my grandparents living there, and the other corner of the street has my other grandfather there. Uh, well, he's not there, but my grandfather mm -hmm. is there running the hotel. Quite an attachment to this, yes. to this <laughs> spot. So. Emily, what happened next? Well, following the wedding, Emily and Sam Wheeler, as the wedding invitations tell us, moved back to the Wheeler Hotel operation in Columbia, South Carolina, which was called the Columbia Hotel. It was there on Main Street, right across from where Sylvan's Jewelry Store is today. Actually, the Columbia Art Museum sits on this spot. Um, they would operate the Columbia Hotel in the winter and every summer as soon as the season began. The Wheeler Hotel here would be locked up in the wintertime and in the summer they would come back and the whole season and the focus would be here again. Here we have a remarkable picture. <clears throat> uh, this hangs on the wall in my dining room and I've blown it up a little bit larger here that you can see. Uh, is Joseph Noteman and his family sitting around the dining room table in that house right there and we have Fanny, this is in Fanny, my grandmother and grandfather, which would have to be right after they were married, Emily and Sam Wheeler. There's John Ostoff, the, fan, the uh, son-in-law who has taken so many of these pictures, his daughter, uh, Parthenia. Joe and Grandma Nodeman side by side, and the couple over here on the right are Bob's favorites, but <laughs> this is Clara Herr, Clara Nodeman Herr, and her husband, Charlie Herr. We actually have the vase that's sitting up on the corner there. It was one of Ms. Wheeler's cut glass wedding presents, and so this had to have been right after the wedding. But it says on the back of the picture, it says, A Happy Family, 1904. But that does not last for long. 1905 was a tough year for the family. Paul, Joseph Nodeman's youngest son, died in the summer of 1905. He and his pretty wife, Essie, had just returned from the opening of the fabulous World's Fair in St. Louis. Pneumonia, with no cure back then, quickly took him out. Six months later, Big Joseph Nodeman died right here at his home in Hendersonville. His body was taken right from the train station down there back to Cincinnati for the funeral. Two months following the mo followed the most unthinkable, the beautiful Nodeman daughter, Clara Herr, died in Covington as well. They lost three of the prominent family members all within less than a year. 1905, that's a big year in Hendersonville. Electricity had just come to Hendersonville uh, the year before. The Hendersonville Courthouse is just finished in that year. The First Presbyterian Church near the Nodeman home is just being finished, and it's no surprise that Joseph Noterman donated one of the three sets of stained glass windows in that church building. On the windows are shown three sets of names, Joseph Noterman, Paul Noterman, and Clara Herr, all who had died within a year of each other. Yes, Bob, and here I have a picture that was in one of these scrapbooks, and this shows a picture of that window in black and white and down here you have the four names on the memorial windows Paul, Joseph Noteman, Clara Herr, his daughter and a vacant window that I'm sure would be used for grandmother Noteman later and Bob and I have followed up on the history of these windows extensively and this could just be a whole nother program but we, this is how we met and this has been a project in itself but this is what sure brought us has. really all together from the it, start. It sure As is. Bob says it's providential that we were all brought together in the yeah. first place. That's right. 1905 was a hard year for the Wheeler family as well. The family home at the farm in Newberry had burned and a new one had been rebuilt to take its place and again let me say here, this is in the baby books, and how I know this fact is because of this page that I would like to show you. Right here, it says that the Wheeler home was burned in 1906 in February, and on Saturday of 1906, David Henry Wheeler died. They were able to get the house rebuilt just before he died. You know, there's a saying in history that the only difference between myth and history is that history is written down. That's why I think it's so important that everyone do this today. These baby books have been 
just invaluable to us in figuring this family history. We would never have known when the house in Newberry was built, which is still, still standing. We would never know why it was built because the other one had burned. But what I don't know and what's not written in the margins is they didn't tell us was the house that burned on the same place, was the house that burned David Henry Wheeler's house, or was it his father John Simeon Wheeler's house that I have heard that burned. Those gravestones that y'all moved from the family home, were they at that site? We don't know where it was. It's just why it's so important today mm -hmm. that things that we take for granted that, that everyone's going to know in the future, yeah, really they're critical. not. You've really got to write these things down. Another photo that we have from this period says so much. Here we are at the Wheeler Farm in Little Mountain, and there's John Ostoff, the photographer, his wife, Fanny, and their daughter, Parthenia, who are visiting at the new Wheeler home in Little Mountain. There are two of the Wheeler brothers in this picture, Martin Luther and Henry Frank, and Emily is awaiting the birth of her first child, David Henry Wheeler, who was named for his grandfather, who had died only six months before he was born. From here, the focus returns to Hendersonville. Her daughter, Clara Nodeman Wheeler, who was named for her deceased sister, Clara Herr, was born in the Nodeman home across the street from the Wheeler Hotel. Aunt Jock's son, James Paul Pless, was also born in the Nodeman house that same summer. Again, the baby books tell us all of this. And you do see here the importance that the Noteman home is taking now in this family. We have the marriages, the weddings, and the, dirt, the death of the father there. This gets to be a very personal thing mm -hmm. to you with a family. A piece of real estate when it's where births, deaths, and marriages take place, of That's course. Right. We actually have the very bed at our house in Ridge Spring in which these children were born and in which Joseph Noteman died. Back to Hendersonville. Anytime you have a lot of children, you've got a lot of people with different ideas about their, how they want to divide up a family estate. Grandmother Nodeman was left all alone in the big house in Hendersonville for five years. Summers with the arrival of her daughters and grandchildren would have been lively, but long cold winters while the rest were away would have been lonely indeed. Think about it. There were no social security checks coming in back then. Upkeep and maintenance on that big old house would be just the same as now. In 1907, she sold a part of the property to Dr. A.B. Drafts, who lived and is buried here in Hendersonville, and whose mother was not surprisingly David Henry Wheeler's sister. This morning I was surprised to see that Dr. A.B. Drafts delivered no less little Clara Wheeler. Why should I be surprised at that? That's right. On May the 26th, 1910, this becomes important, Philippine Noterman sold her home in Hendersonville to R.L. Vernon for $10,000. A society clipping noted that her children gathered for a farewell party and this was the, quote, occasion of her going to see the world. Mr. Vernon's subsequent plans and ventures with this large piece of real estate, this is the Noteman home and the huge house on it, eventually led to its opening in 1919 as the first Hendersonville High School. This becomes a separate story in itself. The carefully landscaped grounds and the meticulously pruned and rounded boxwoods have all been removed in subsequent photos of the Nodeman home, now converted to Hendersonville High School. Instead of four lovely daughters in long flowing gowns and grandchildren in lacy dresses with matching parasols, we now see the teachers and 200 boys and girls out on the front steps wearing caps, jackets, sailor collars, black stockings, and most of all, short dresses. <laughs> Meanwhile, back across the street, the heirs of David Henry Wheeler, the other three brothers, seem to be breathing down the neck of Samuel Fair Wheeler, the hotel proprietor. This is a blueprint, Bob, that I want to show you. I've never been able to bring this up here before, but this is a blueprint that I have that was given to me just a year or so ago of how they intended to subdivide that property across the street into 75 lots called Wheeler Park. This was drawn up in 1910. Hendersonville, they even, they, the architects, the justices, you, do you spell yours this way? Is this that's, your that's family not my here? Family, not my family. And Howard and Caldwell sales agents in both Hendersonville and Columbia. This it came from Dr. Jacob Simeon Wheeler's family, and I take it that they had this plan in place. If this had happened in 1910, instead of looking at that mm -hmm. Boyd Park School, it, the Drysdale School over there now, we would be looking at Hendersonville's largest subdivision. This, this development. Fortunately, right. this apparently never happened. Yeah. Well, we're all so glad that it didn't happen. <laughs> so. Uh, by the summer of 1911 and 12, things were changing on the hotel scene as well. Well, 
Grandma Nodeman had sold her home across the street two years before and had started living alternately with different children in the family. Um, while the Wheeler Hotel remained extraordinarily popular and stayed rather permanently booked with guests renewing their reservations for the following year upon their departure, things were not going so well at the Columbia Hotel down in South Carolina. Motor cars were completely replacing horse and buggies as more paved roads and highways were being completed to accommodate them. Downtown Columbia even put in electric streetcars and trolleys. The high-rise Jefferson Hotel opened in Columbia just a block up the street from the Wheelers. It was going to be stiff competition. In 1913, as Emily Nodeman Wheeler was sitting in Newberry awaiting the upcoming season in Hendersonville and the birth of her third child, the unthinkable happened. A fire broke out in the Columbia Hotel on Main Street and gutted the entire building. The Lark and Lawrence hardware store below it had contained shotgun shells and their bursting prevented the firemen from being able to put out the fire. All the hotel contents were lost, even Mrs. Wheeler's grand piano in the lobby. An entire set of new china had just arrived for the hotel. None of it was insured. The final season of the Wheeler Hotel opened in Hendersonville in 1913 as Sam Wheeler struggled with the losses in Columbia, as well as the brothers who were wanting a settlement on their father's estate. Samuel Fair Wheeler, my father, was born there in the Wheeler Hotel that summer, 100 years, right up a year ago, right up there on that hill, just before the Wheelers had to sell their interest and divide it with the brothers. Dr. Jacob Wheeler's spectacular white mansion in prosperity rose right after this. <laughs> my father's family moved down to Umatilla, Florida for several years, but returned to the family home in Little Mountain by his first year in grammar school. He, his brother and sister, all attended the one-room schoolhouse, Wheeland School, that was built by his grandfather and given to the community. It is still standing today. The management of the Wheeler Hotel was taken up by Mr. Cobb and the name was changed to the Carolina Terrace. I have here a brochure of the Carolina Terrace when it opened and it's really interesting, Bob, to see the changes mm -hmm. as they updated this. It would only take someone like me who was, they took all of the heart pine boards that had been so lovingly milled and hand done mm -hmm. in, the, in Newberry and brought them up and they painted them white. They had to update it. The Victorian dresses and the dark Victorian uh, walls were gone. This was now moving toward Art Deco. Times were changing, everything was changing and it's just like today, everybody wants to be up to date. So the, the hotel really took on a different face. The horse and buggy days were over. The flappers were arriving. Electricity and cars were changing everything everything except the tourism. The tourism in Hendersonville never changes because the attractions that drew the Wheelers, the Notermans, the Vanderbilts, just legions of people remain the same. The crisp, cool mountain breezes are still here. The pink blankets of cherry laurel blanket the countryside. And then the purple blankets of wild rhododendron follow. The color never fades from the blue mop head hydrangeas, the white snowballs, and then the orange fields of waving daylilies continue the endless parade of summer color. The mountain streams and brooks gurgle as you drive down any road. Just open your windows. Listen, they're there. The waterfalls splash and the children still squeal with delight at their frozen little feet. Best of all, for those who can find a way, awaits the ultimate prize, Triple Falls, and the best kept tourist attraction in the world, DuPont Forest. The very waterfalls that entice the daughters, great-granddaughters, and great-great-great-granddaughters of Joseph Noterman are still flowing, exactly as they were when they were lifting those long, heavy skirts in Victorian days. A century ago, some things, thankfully, never change.